"I call it Allen a Dale picking," the minstrel answered. He would have expounded further, but Kali interrupted him, saying: "Good, Willie, good boy! Now play the others." He beamed at what Schmendrick hoped was an expression of pleased surprise. "I said that there were several songs about me. There are thirty one to be exact, though none are in the child collection just at present." His eyes widened suddenly and he grasped the magician's shoulders. "You wouldn't be Mr. Child himself, now, would you?" he demanded. "He often goes seeking ballads, so I've heard, disguised as a plain man." Schmendrick shook his head. "No, I'm very sorry, really." The Captain sighed and released him. "It doesn't matter," he murmured. "One always hopes, of course. Even now, to be collected, to be verified, annotated, to have variant versions, even to have one's authenticity d doubted. Well, well, never mind. Sing the other songs, Willie lad. You'll need to practice one day, when you're field recorded." The outlaws grumbled and scuffed, kicking at stones. A hoarse voice bawled from a safe shadow. "'Nah, Willie, sing us a true song. Sing us one about Robin Hood.' "'Who said that?' Cully's loosened sword clacked in its sheath as he turned from side to side. His face suddenly seemed as pale and weary as a used lemon drop. "'I did,' said Molly Grew, who actually hadn't. "'The men are bored with ballads of your bravery, Captain Darling, even if you did write them all yourself.' Cully winced and stole a side glance at Schmendrick. "'They can still be folk songs, can't they, Mr. Child?' he asked in a low, worried voice. "'After all—' "'I'm not Mr. Child,' Schmendrick said. "'Really, I'm not.' "'I mean, you can't leave epic events to the people. They get everything wrong.' An aging rogue, in tattered velvet now, slunk forward. "'Captain, if we're to have folk songs, and I suppose we must, then we feel they ought to be true songs about real outlaws, not this lying life we live. No offense, Captain, but we're really not very merry when all said, "'I'm merry twenty-four hours a day, Dick Fancy,' Cully said coldly. "'That is a fact.' "'And we don't steal from the rich and give to the poor,' Dick Fancy hurried on. "'We steal from the, for from the poor because they can't fight back, most of them, "'and the rich take from us because they could wipe us out in a day. "'We don't rob the fat, greedy mayor on the highway. "'We pay him tribute every month to leave us alone. "'We never carry off proud bishops and keep them prisoner in the wood, "'feasting and entertaining them because Molly had hasn't any good dishes. "'And besides,' We just wouldn't be very stimulating company for a bishop. When we go to the fair in disguise, we never win at archery or at sting single stick. We do get some nice compliments on our disguises, but no more than that. I sent a tapestry to the judging once, Molly remembered. It came in fourth. Fifth. A night at vigil. Everyone was doing vigils that year. Suddenly, she was scrubbing her eyes with horny knuckles. Damn you, Cully! What? What? he yelled in exasperation. Is it my fault you didn't keep up with your weaving? Once you had your man, you let all your accomplishments go. You don't sew or sing any more. You haven't illuminated in a manuscript in years. And what happened to that Viola de Gamba I got you? He turned to Schmendrick. We might as well be married the way she's gone to seed. The magician nodded frant fractionally and looked away. "'And as for righting wrongs and fighting for civil liberties, that sort of thing,' Dick Fancy said, "'it wouldn't be so bad. "'I mean, I'm not the crusader type myself. "'Some are and some aren't. "'But then we have to sing those songs about wearing Lincoln green and aiding the oppressed. "'We don't, Cully. "'We turn them in for the reward. "'And those songs are just embarrassing, that's all, and there's the truth of it.' Captain Cully folded his arms, ignoring the outlaw's snarls of agreement. Sing the songs, Willie. I'll not. The minstrel would not raise a hand to touch his lute. And you never fought my brothers for any stone, Cully. You wrote them a letter, which you didn't sign. Cully drew his arm back, and blades blinked among the men, as though someone had blown on a heap of coals. At this point, Schmendrick stepped forward again, smiling urgently. "'If I may offer an, an alternative,' he suggested, "'why not let your guest earn his night's lodging by amusing you? 
I can neither sing nor play, but I have my own accomplishments, and you may not have seen their like. Jack Jingly agreed immediately, saying, Aye, call a magician! "'Twould be a rare treat for the lads.' Molly Grew grumbled some savage generalization about wizards as a class, but the men shouted with quick delight, throwing one another into the air. The only real reluctance was shown by Captain Cully himself, who protested sadly. "'Yes, but the songs. Mr. Child must hear the songs.' "'And so I will,' Schmendrick assured him. "'Later.' Cully brightened then and cried to his men to give way and make room. They sprawled and squatted in the shadows, watching with sprung grins as Smendrick began to run through the old flummeries with which he had entertained the country folk at the midnight carnival. It was paltry magic, but he thought it diverting enough for such a crew as Cully's. But he had judged them too easily. They applauded his rings and scarfs, his ears full of goldfish and aces, with proper politeness, but without wonder. Offering no true magic, he drew no magic back from them. And when a spell failed, as when promising to turn a duck into a duke for them to rob, he produced a handful of duke cherries. He was clapped just as kindly and vacantly as though he had succeeded. They were a perfect audience. Cully smiled impatiently, and Jack Jingly dozed, but it startled the magician to see the disappointment in Molly Grew's restless eyes. Sudden anger made him laugh. He dropped seven spinning balls that had been glowing brighter and brighter as he juggled them. On a good evening, he could make them catch fire. Let go of all his hated skills and closed his eyes. Do as you will, he whispered to the magic. Do as you will. It sighed through him, beginning somewhere secret, in his shoulder blade, perhaps, or in the marrow of his shin bone. His heart filled and tautened like a sail and something moved more surely in his body than he ever had. It spoke with his voice, commanding. Weak with power, he sank to his knees and waited to be Schmendrick again. I wonder what I did. I did something. He opened his eyes. Most of the outlaws were chuckling and tapping their temples, glad of the chance to mock him. Captain Cully had risen, anxious to pronounce that part of the entertainment ended, when Molly Grew cried out in a soft, shaking voice, and all turned to see what she had saw. A man came walking into the clearing. He was dressed in green, but for a brown jerkin and a slanting brown cap with a woodcock's feather in it. He was very tall, too tall for a living man. The great bow slung over his shoulder looked as long as Jack Jingly, and his arrows would have made spears or staves for Captain Cully. Taking no notice at all of the still, shabby forms by the fire, he strode through the light and vanished, with no sound of breath or footfall. After him came others, one at a time or two together, some conversing, many laughing, but none making any sound. All carried longbows and all wore green, save one who came clad in scarlet to his toes, and another gowned in a friar's brown habit, his feet in sandals, and his enormous belly contained by a roped belt. One played a lute, and sang silently as he walked. Alan a Dale! It was raw, willy gentle. Look at those changes! His voice was as naked as a baby bird. Effortlessly proud, graceful as giraffes, even the tallest among them, a kind-eyed blunderbore, the bowmen moved across the clearing, Last, hand in hand, came a man and a woman. Their faces were as beautiful as though they had never known fear. The woman's heavy hair shone with a secret, like a cloud that hides the moon. Oh, said Molly Grew, Marion! Robin Hood is a myth, Captain Cully said nervously, a classic example of the heroic folk figures synthesized out of need. John Henry is another. Men have to be heroes, but no man can ever be as big as the need, and so a legend grows around a grain of truth like a pearl. Not that it isn't a remarkable trick, of course. It was the seed dandy Dick Fancy who moved first. All the figures but the last two had passed into the darkness when he rushed after them, calling hoarsely, Robin! Robin, Mr. Hood, sir, wait for me! Neither the man nor the woman turned, 
But every man of Cully's band, save only Jack Jingley and the captain himself, ran to the clearing's edge, tripping and trampling one another, kicking the fire so that the clearing churned with shadows. Robin! they shouted, and Marion! Scarlet! Little John! Come back! Come back! Schmendrick began to laugh, tenderly and helplessly. Over their voices, Captain Cully screamed, Fools! Fools and children! It was a lie, like all magic. There is no such person as Robin Hood. But the outlaws, wild with loss, went crashing into the woods after the shining archers, stumbling over logs, falling through thorn bushes, wailing hungrily as they ran. Only Molly Grew stopped and looked back. Her face was burning white. Nay, Cully, you have it backward, she called to him. There's no such a person as you or me, or any of us. Robin and Marion are real, and we are the legend. Then she ran on, crying, Wait! Wait! like the others, leaving Captain Cully and Jack Jingley to stand in the trampled firelight and listen to the magician's laugh.